Great to be with you. Happy holidays, belated Merry Christmas, early Happy New Year. On Friar Podcast, Darnay Trip, Derek Togerson. Good to see you, Derek. Haven't seen you since Christmas. How the holiday treat you? Very well. How about you? Good, good. No complaints at all. Good to be on with you again. And uh, we've got one of our favorite guests, Derek, a guy whose brain we always enjoy picking. And a topic that is very important as the Padres try and construct this roster. Uh, so very much looking forward to this conversation with John Conniff, friend from Mad Friars. Uh, look forward to picking his brain about uh, the Padres, the prospects, and uh, how much help we can expect, the club can expect in the coming months, in the coming season. First things first, thanks to OG, the sponsor of the On Friar podcast. You can, uh, well, I see, I don't know about these, Derek. These are a lot of holiday promotions. I don't know if OG's is still doing the holiday promotion. So I'm going to have to ask for something. Some... they go through the new year most yeah, likely, maybe. right? So if if that's the case, you can get an OG's gift card of 25 or more. You can also get a Coca-Cola ornament with that. And uh, when you spend $35 and enjoy an OG's pint, you'll cheers the season with an OG's holiday glass for your collection. We're not sure if uh, the locations are still participating in that. But what we do know is OG's got great food, great beer list, and always a great place to watch a game. So thanks to OGs and all they do for the On Fire podcast. Without further ado, the walk-up music. It is the On Friar podcast. There is much to discuss and the perfect guy to discuss it with. He is John Conniff of Mad Friars. Using I... the J.J. Abrams lens flare today, too. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I know. Dramatic lighting there. It is. I got to turn this down. In the background, you can still see, I think, an old picture of me from my Poway High School basketball days. Yeah. How about it? Are you still playing, John? Not at my age, man. My knees and ankles went a long time ago. So yeah. uh, then the problem is when you don't play for a while, you start thinking that all these things you couldn't do that you used to. Then you, then you go, if I could do as many things as I used to think I could have done, I would have been a lot better than I was. So, uh, what color Chuck Taylors are you wearing in that picture? <laughs> man, it's like I'm on the it's like I'm on the five point five podcast with Eric and Danny. Man, the boomer <laughs> jokes are starting quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, for what it's worth, I'm starting to feel like my back and my knees won't allow me to play pickup basketball much longer. So I don't, I'm not there far behind you, unfortunately. Yes. Well, I appreciate you doing this in short notice. You'd reached out a few weeks ago. Uh, you dropped your top 30, as you right. guys always do, uh, in waves. Yours was the first out on mm -hmm. madfriars.com. And you guys obviously always do a fantastic job. Um, you. you know, nobody, nobody covers uh the prospects the farm quite like you guys and uh this is you know a great time to kind of get refreshed as they trickle out when's the next one coming out yours is out next one should either be uh david j or kevin charity and then ben davy and mark wilkins to follow up and then the big one which we do right before the start of spring training we do you know we do a top 30 so everyone can compare them to how we do baseball america mlb pipeline but our big one we do is a top 20 which you know if you're um if you're a Padres fan and you're kind of interested in the minors, knowing about the top 20 guys, you're going to be fine with that, or even more the top 10. Because one thing by doing the minor leagues, you see how many guys are, are and just how difficult it really is to, to make it to the major leagues. And that's always a part that's kind of interesting for me. No doubt. This, the, the only question anybody has, John, this is all, <laughs> all I want to ask you today is uh -oh. – Aside from Ethan Salas, who was untouchable, yeah. do the Padres have the players in the minor league system to get Randy or Rosarena before spring training? <laughs> I think there's about four guys that are close to being untouchable, about the top four list. And, you know, as we talked about, um, I think before and with some other people is, you know, the Padres kind of kind of got to start being on uh, a budget after living the champagne dream. So they're going to need these guys to come up. And, I think the problem with the Rosarena is he's about they only have him for two years and he'll be kind of expensive. I I always think the team they're more likely to trade with would be someone like Milwaukee or Miami, because I think they're going to be looking for guys that are controllable assets. I mean, especially Milwaukee, they have 
three really good young outfielders, and they're going to have to trade at least one of them. So the Padres do have a little bit of depth at pitching they could use. But to answer Derek's question, I think they do have the guys to trade for Randy Rosarena. Whether or not they would want to is another question. So I have, um, I have, as I've done in the past with you, mm-hmm. just a list of names. Cool. And what what is fun is just peppering you with these guys. I'm sure Derek has a lot of the same guys in mind. I'm sure anybody that's watching, listening has uh, the same names in mind. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of go through that list. But just from a big picture standpoint, as the Padres are constructing this roster, which seems to be a little bit harder this year than it has Mm -hmm. in the past, and the moves have been few and far between and slow to come by, um, as you kind of referenced, they're in a place where they they need these controllable, cheap options to kind of help out. In the immediate future, before we go into the weeds and and knowing that we'll talk about all these guys, big picture, 30,000-foot view, how prepared is the minor league system to help the Padres in 2024? I think in the second half, they'd have a better chance of helping those guys. And I think when I didn't get, we were going back and forth. I didn't think Derek and I got a chance to talk. I think one day when he was subbing in for, for Darren, you know, there's, there's two things you got to keep in mind is, you know, when AJ Preller thinks someone is ready to go up, is pretty much is a little bit different than maybe when I or the rest of us or more baseball think someone's ready to go up. And I think I'm going to reference um, what Derek was talking about with Jackson Merrill. Now, I think Jackson Merrill is, is a top player, was my top prospect. I think he could use about another half year in the minors. Now, do I think there's a chance that something could happen? Maybe they try and trade Kim and suddenly Merrill's on the opening day roster starting at second base or shortstop, you know, I could see that. I don't think that'd be the wisest move, but something like that. But yeah, I think especially you can see a lot of the young pitching could really be ready in the second half. But I think for a lot of these guys, most of whom start off in a ball level, it's kind of foolish, I think, to put them on the roster to begin with. But then again, a couple of years ago, I ran my mouth off about CJ Abrams and ended up paying off a huge bet to the 5.5 podcast and cause a poultry <laughs> shortage in, uh, in San Diego County with how much chicken those guys could eat. So I definitely could be wrong. Assuming that Xander Bogarts is the shortstop, which I think yeah. is probably a pretty safe assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked about Jackson Merrill and his yes. ability to improve his lateral movement. Does he have the, I guess, body frame and uh, and ability to play second base right now? Because it's, it's very different making that turn from that side of the diamond than it is from shortstop. Does he, I mean, has he improved to the point where he can play on the right side, at least for for in the short term? Well, he played a little bit of second base. He even played a game at first and a little bit in, in left field, but those are very, you know, I mean, I think there were a couple games. As far as Jackson Merrill, and I apologize if I've said this before, but, you know, I'm getting old, so I can get away with that now, is, you know, Merrill is, Merrill was a really small guy and had a late growth growth spurt in high school. And so he's very much, he's a very good high makeup guy and all this. But one thing you, you can kind of get, can kind of go past you a little bit, and it shouldn't, is Merrill's a really big kid. I mean, he's 6'3", about 2'10". And he moves very well. He's a very good athlete, has a very strong arm. And, you know, if he comes up next year, it would not surprise me to see the Padres move Bogarts off at shortstop and move more to second base and put Merrill at short. But, you know, that's pure speculation on my part. I don't know that. But, you know, yes, I do think Merrill could handle second. But I think he just needs a little bit more, you know, I think he needs a little bit more seasoning. And, you know, we're going to kind of talk about this as this podcast goes on. The way I look when people move up, I think last year, Merrill, there was a pretty good, there's a pretty good debate in the Padres whether they're going to start him at San Antonio or Fort Wayne. And they chose to be a little more conservative. You know, Jackson had a stomach ailment, some respiratory problems, had a little bit of injuries. Then the cold weather, he slowed down a little bit in Fort Wayne. But there was never any thought that he needs to go back to like Elsinore, where he played only played about 45 games did well in the NFL. He was where he was supposed to be. If they had moved him up to San Antonio, then you know that might have been a different different discussion. Like, should he have been that big a jump? Should they have done this? I mean, you always want to move, think someone up when you don't think that sending him back down is going to do anything. And that, that's how I look at it. 
Um, you said four guys are untouchable. I don't, I don't know if you said specifically what four guys. Sal is obviously being one of them. I think it's tough to. I think Merrill. The, how I look at the top ten, in my opinion, I think all of us are going to pretty much agree that you can have somewhere in the order of Merrill, Salas, uh, Dylan Lesko, and Robbie Snelling. Now, I mean, when you, you how I put these guys could be different than than you guys or anyone really because. All prospect ratings are about how much someone values floor and how much someone values ceiling. So, like maybe, you know, Darnay is someone who says, Look, I just want to know who's going to make it here. I don't really care about who's going to be a superstar and all this. So, how I'm ranking Robbie Snelling would be number one. That'd be my top guy because he's the most likely to make it. Then probably Jackson Merrill. Then, you know, Ethan Salas or Dylan Lesko. Well, Derek could say, Look, tell me who's going to be really good. Tell me who could be the potential superstar. Then he could have Dylan, Dylan Lesko as number one guy because he is number one starter stuff. Then Ethan Salas, a left-hand hitting catcher with real high on base percentage. And then Jackson Merrill and then, and then uh, Robbie Snelling. It just depends upon kind of – it's very subjective. It's how you look at it. So there's th – these prospect ratings are really more of a grouping of the top guys. And hopefully when you read them, you know, it's – so every reader or listener can kind of see what they do or don't like about someone and how likely they are to make it. Did you ever have Mackenzie Gore and or C.J. Abrams labeled as untouchables? Pretty close. I mean, I think we had C.J. We had Mackenzie Gore after what he did in Lake Elsinore. Um, Abrams, you know, as I was joking about the bet, I, I thought Abrams was a really strange case in that he had this dominating year in the Arizona Complex League. Then COVID came. He was at, you know, the, the camp they had at USD. And then they they made the pretty bold move. They jumped him all the way to double A without any high A, and he got hurt midway through the year, played in the AFL. And then I think when they put him on the roster too quick, he struggled because he just was – there's a reason there's different levels of the minor leagues. You know, he struggled against breaking pitches. He struggled against, you know, guys with good velocity and he could move stuff around. So that was kind of the problem with him. I don't think – I shouldn't use the phrase untouchable. I mean, there's always someone you can trade someone for. But I think a, a good example of that is when we were talking, you know, in the Juan Soto trade. I, I would still make the Soto trade if I had to do that today. James Wood was pretty close to being untouchable for me. See, that's the, that's the reason I was asking is because you got these, these four guys here listed as the quote-unquote untouchables. Mm -hmm. But – C.J. Abrams, Mackenzie Gore, James Wood were traded for Juan Soto. Yeah. So I wondered if you guys had them. Are, are Merrill Snelling better prospects than Gore and Abrams in your eyes? Or is Juan Soto just a special case of, yeah, in, you get a guy like that, literally nobody is untouchable? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question, and I think it's kind of a both. You know, I think one if Juan Soto was out there and you get a chance for a three-year window – and as a pot, San Diego Padres fan since 1976, who's seen this team win a grand total of one World Series game and going into its 55th year, yes, I would like to. I'd like to see a championship <laughs> before I leave this planet. Um, so you would have to take that that deal. As far as if they're better prospects, I mean, a lot of these things are just kind of ebbs and flows. I mean, I think Mackenzie Gore was much more tradable when they did it compared to if he had had the same type of success that he did at Elsinore at the higher levels. I mean, he ran into some back issues, some mechanics things. There were some, I think there were some development issues. And, you know, it's kind of the thing I worry a little bit about with Ethan Salas right now myself, but I think I'm more in the minority on that. We'll obviously uh, get to Ethan. Just to kind of button up the Merrill conversation, you already mm -hmm. touched on it, but we've, we've got some questions coming in about him filling the hole in left field and another about how his bat plays, you know, because we're talking about like offensive profiles to suit positions. And that was kind of the Jay Cronenworth issue is like he doesn't have a first baseman's bat. And so it's kind of a clunky fit. Um, if, if, and I think there are questions about his power too and, and mm -hmm. how he's developed from that standpoint. Um, how, how would you assess Jackson Merrill, his profile, having had some experience in the outfield and as he's developing as a, as a power hitter, whether he would be a natural fit in a position like that? He's a very, you know, he's a very good prospect. He's a very good athlete. One thing we really kind of wanted to see from, from Jackson coming into this year was he's a left, right guy. So a lot of his power was kind of to left center. 
and we wanted to see if he could pull the ball a little bit more, and he definitely showed he could pull the ball in Fort Wayne. So he's really starting to come in to his power. You know, as I said, I just think I think they have him pegged right now to be at El Paso for AAA. And seeing a, a combination of better breaking pitches, better spin, I think is really going to help him. And I think the power could come. If you put him in there on opening day, I think the power would be a little lacking. I think a lot of things would be. It'd be a bit of a, a rush in my opinion. So, you know, I think he's fine for about a half year there. Now we got a couple of different ways we can go here. Cause you talked about mm-hmm. the, the, I'm sure Darnay has a list of guys he wants to get to, but they talked about the Juan Soto thing. Um, mm-hmm. I'll take it in this direction to another guy to talk about, because he's the one that AJ Preller brought up during the post Juan Soto trade press conference. And it's Jacob Marcy, a guy yes. who kind of popped out of nowhere during the, uh, the Arizona fall league, really hit a good year at a, at, Fort Wayne and San Antonio, and then right. just popped like crazy, won the AFL MVP award, which, by the way, has been won by guys like Chris Bryant, Ronald Acuna Jr. So it's, you, you can't be a bad ball player and win that award. So tell us tell us your assessment on him. Is it um, too much too soon? Uh, I, was, I was surprised that AJ would mention him as a guy this year who could possibly take some of those at-bats in left field at Petco Park. Well, we all like AJ, and AJ says a lot of things. Um, I think Jacob some of them are Mar- true. Many of them are not. Yes. <laughs> some of them are. Yeah, he's a good interview. Uh, J- well, one, I mean, th- the problem with Arizona Fall League stats are, and I've been told this by a lot of guys in you know in the minors, is that a lot of people are tend to be working on things. I mean, that's where you take the pitcher and tell him he's going to develop a curve, and if he gives up some runs, you know, that's fine. And some of the best pitchers aren't out there. You know, a guy like Buddy Reed, I'm sure you guys remember him. He had a big airs in the fall leg, and then he he couldn't hit at Amarillo, and the three of us could probably hit about 280 at Amarillo in that park. Um, if you add up all three of our totals, yes, probably about 280. I mean, well, you know, I, I saw a guy from hit an opposite field broken bad home run in Amarillo. <laughs> So that's, wait, wait, wait. You said opposite field, broken bat, was home Reed. run. Yeah, yeah. Reed popped one right over the left field wall when he was batting from the left side. I mean, well, the thing is, that park is at such elevation. And he, when Tony Gwynn played there a long time ago, it was this big, huge park, the one, the old part they had outside of town. So it was like playing in like a course field with like a 450 down center, center field and about 380 down when they got the new park, they moved inside the little downtown. So it's a small park at altitude. So when you look at Arizona Diamondback stats, Reno and Amarillo are two of the best sitting parks in the minor leagues. But as far as to go back to Jacob Marcy, Marcy was really something the Padres should be proud of. He was a six round pick. He mainly played right field. I saw him when he first came to like Elsinore for being drafted. I thought he was, he was kind of okay because he played right field uh, mainly in college. And then when I saw him in Fort Wayne, he does remind you of a Trent Grisham in the outfield where he makes a lot of plays look a lot easier than they, they can. And the one thing you notice about him for a center fielder, and I thought Robert Hassel was a decent center fielder too when I saw him, but Hassel's one problem was he had trouble kind of going back on the ball. And that's that's a lot more difficult for a center fielder than a corner guy. Marcy has no problems. Moves there. He has a tremendous eye. You know, in college, he had a 400 on-base percentage. He had really good on-base numbers early on, but there was some pro- – it was a question if he was too passive or pitches he was swinging at, and they really worked with him on that, and he made tremendous gains. The second half, you know, he showed a lot of power, kept on-base, tremendous defender. Now, the problem with putting him in the major league lineup is – He's played 16 games above a ball. Okay. So, I mean, I, I understand there's on a fall league. Those are good numbers. Maybe that might push him to El Paso, but I think, I think putting him up there would be, wouldn't be a wise move, but you know, watch, I'll make a bet with Eric and uh spring training that he'll make the roster and then he'll be eating like, you know, gobs of Szechuan food when I come out to uh, <laughs> San Diego. To keep <laughs> losing these bets. Yeah. Oh, he can eat. Yeah. So it actually, <laughs> but no, uh, I think he's a very good player. I mean, that's a, a really good guy to focus on. Just, you know, it's only 16 games. You should probably wait. And pretty much Graham Pauly's kind of in, I got a feeling that's coming next from Derek. And he's kind of been in the same, same boat. Why do you know me so well, John? I'm going to go through all the outfielders who could possibly be there. 
Kate, well, we're gonna, Kate I know you and I are going to talk about Yairo Iriarty, who we both saw in spring training. That's yeah, oh, yeah, we talked about him in spring training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Caden in the him. chat saying uh, between Merrill, Marcy, Martarella, and Polly, who's primed for the biggest 2024. And if you're watching live on YouTube, get in the chat, and we'll, we'll get to your questions. Um, uh, Caden, does that mean who's primed for the biggest year at the big league level or biggest year in general? Good question. John, yeah. John I'll, let, I'll let you go whatever direction you think is most realistic with those four then. I think, you know, I put Merrill at the top. I think Merrill could have a big year. All those guys are, are very good. I, I, as again, I think the main thing is just, you know, let, let them cook a little bit. I mean, you know, it's like uh, both Darnay and I like food a lot. I mean, we could have a great chocolate cake in the oven. If it calls for 30 minutes, we're not taking it out after 10. <laughs> <laughs> if it smells good enough, it might. It smells good. We might be tempted to do it. But, you know, we, we should probably wait just a little bit. So uh, those guys, you know, Pauly and Marcier are really good picks by the Padres. Uh, they got them later in the draft. They've developed them really well. They made some adjustments to Pauly to get him to have a little more loft in this game. I know in Fort Wayne they were working really hard on getting Marcy to really pick his pitch and really kind of go after it. Marcy looks like a running, like a high school running back that he was. Mm -hmm. He's a he's actually a better athlete than he looks like. I mean, he can really play the hell out of center field. I mean, he is a special defensive player out there. And as you look at the tra the trajectory for Marcy as somebody who could maybe be one of those back half of 2024 type guys mm -hmm. after he kind of marinates and spends a little bit more time in the oven, how much longer does Graham Pauly do you think need? Pauly, you know, I think with those guys, is they, they had such a, you know, if those are the top four guys, you know, then he can kind of go down and I kind of would put Pauly and Marcy in a category with those two. And then I would go down and, go with Iriarte, uh, Drew Thorpe, where they just got and Mazer, the pitchers next. The thing with Paulie and Marcy is they came so quick. I think I just want to see that it's not just a huge year. I mean, if people remember, right, I think the last time I was on here, I was talking about how wonderful I thought Jay Groom would be. And Jay Groom had a really good year. And then he had a really tough year this year. So you kind of, the thing about baseball is, it makes prospect writing and that kind of interesting to me is it's all it's fascinating to talk about what guys can do or what they've showed flashes of doing but value is about what someone can do over a consistent period of time if someone's listening on their phone and they hear me talking about you know how great adrian morahone looked at they were probably saying if conniff talks about morahone one more time i'm going to throw the phone against the wall you know and i can you know i can see that he, I mean, if you watch Morahone pitch, like I have at about four different levels, he can look amazing. The problem is he's only pitched at most 65 innings in a season. And, you know, you, you need more than that to be a starting pitcher and to be effective for the Padres really to win. There's there's a few questions about the pitchers coming into the chat. Uh, Clay asking, uh, Snell is a good fastball, obviously, but if you picked up a tick or two with his velo, would more evaluators consider him as a potential future one, two, one or two? Robbie's really good. And the thing is, someone who has a teenager, if you hear Robbie speak, you're you're amazed. That guy was 19. I mean, it's probably the yeah. most mature kid I've ever talked to in, in my in my life. Um, the biggest thing about Snelling that he's kind of worked on a tick or two in his fastball would always help. Yeah, you know, that's that's a great great point. But I think he's more interested in getting his curveball and slider a little more consistent. He had a lot of work. He really threw his change up a lot. You know, guys like that. Who, who get $3 million out of high school usually don't throw many change-ups to high school batters, especially in Reno, Nevada. So Robbie really learned how to do that. And I think the best quote on Robbie was by a, the Lake Elsinore manager, Pete Samora, who was a, a two-way star at UCLA. He said a lot of people Robbie's age, they see a guy hit a home run off him and they're kind of shocked. They're so good that never happened. And they kind of get a little skittish around him. Yeah, Robbie's philosophy is the opposite. Well, he hit a home run. Now I'm going to stick it up as you know what and prove to him that he doesn't have right. And so he is, he's a really, he's a really nice kid, really quiet, soft spoken, but you get him between the lines and he is a, he competes. <laughs> Robbie That's another football player, though. You know, yeah, he you was going to go to Arizona and play football. He's, he's got that kind of ability and that kind of mentality. Well, no, I mean, Robbie. As an ASU guy, Robbie decided he wanted an education, so he took away his commitment from Arizona and went to LSU. <laughs> but he was going to be a – he's going there as an outside linebacker, which is more interesting more than as a quarterback. 
So he kind of made the pretty mature decision. It's difficult to be an outside linebacker and be a top pitcher. So, uh, you know, good for him. I think he'll start the year off in San Antonio, but, you know, he is a he's a really polished guy. Very, very it turns good. out LSU has a decent quarterback over there. Yeah, they have, they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple more. Uh, first, uh, Donovan wondering why you hate Marcos <laughs> Castagnon. <laughs> Donovan's a mean, mean man. Uh, I don't hate Marcos Castagnon. The problem I have with Marcos Castagnon is Marcos Castagnon, every time I think he's going to take some huge cut and he's going to, you know, the next level is not going to be able to do it, he produces. I mean, the thing about all these guys is someone like me can write or say whatever I want. But these guys get to go out in the field, and if they they put up the numbers, they put up the numbers. Um, as far Donovan, as far as me hating Marcos Castagnon, I mean, you should talk to Mr. David J. I mean, or the writer. I mean, I am a Marcos Castagnon booster compared to him. But Marcos is a good player. I mean, he has a chance to be in a Triple A. He's played both second and third. But you know, I watch Marcos, and he's he's one of the few guys I think even at my age I go. Okay, if it was a sprint down the down to first base, I don't know if I'd win, but I'd take a shot. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would, I would, I'd, I'd, you know, I don't say that about many guys, but you know, he gets the job done. He probably probably doesn't have the arm for third. I don't think he has a range for second. He's hitting, but I mean, he that has to be a really big bat to go to left field. But you know, well, we they can, got a DH in the National League now. There you go. And you know, yeah, by the way, that, that big NBA. swing, I've seen it too. And I'm not yeah. making the comparison because it looks different. But I used to, when I saw him in the minor leagues many years ago, I said the same thing about Javi Baez. I'm like, he's yeah. going to have to cut that thing down at some point because it's just, it's going to be too much when you talk to, you know, big league velocity. And it worked. So maybe he's one of those guys who uh, a nice, big, healthy rip actually ends up working for him all the way up. He is. A, I mean, he's a thing about Marcos. I mean, that's, a, I think it's a really good compliment is Marcos is a baseball player. I mean, Marcos really understands what he, he needs to do on the field. He understands pitch sequences. He understands when there's a pitch for him to go for. And, I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think Marcos put up an 800 OPS at both you know, double A and, and high A. So, you know, if I'm Marcos, I can give a damn what Conniff says. I mean, I'm putting up numbers, so uh, let's go. <laughs> um. I may be more more relevant to the upcoming season. Uh, who is this Ryan Burgert fellow that we've suddenly heard about, and do you expect him to make a start this season? Ryan, I like him. Yeah, Ryan Burgert is going to be the type of guy that you would probably, if Derek is talking the same way he did at spring training when we were together, you're going to hear Derek would rave about him because he raves about Jairo Iriarte. There are these guys who have these fastballs that give the optical – illusion that it's rising it's an uh and vertically and vertically induced break or some I, ivb B, i'm gonna screw that up but anyhow what it means is high spin rate that's that let's just go with the easy when people know yeah they throw it at the top of the zone it's one of the few pitches where someone can under think that there's a fast no there's a fastball coming and for both these guys they throw it in about the high 90s and, you know, Ryan probably needs to kind of throw his sweeper a little bit more and work on his, his changeup. But he kind of had a tough year at Fort Wayne last year, his first year coming off Tommy John. He came back. He lowered, I think, his, his ERA by a couple points. He went up to San Antonio, really looked good, had a shorter arm swing, had a little bit more control, really kept the ball in the park mainly. That, that's a big thing. But, yeah, he he's the guy I think is probably the big – one of the bigger sleepers that most people don't know about. So I would keep an eye on Ryan Berger. Induced vertical break. And I know that because I'm reading your write-up of him on madfriars.com. There you go. I had it there. Yeah. <laughs> in, in a nutshell, for people who are watching on the YouTube channel, right? Most fastballs come in, at, you know, cause they have the certain spin, right? They come in at a certain um, direction and they, they drop due to gravity naturally, right? Guys with the higher spin rates that have the later life on the fastball or the invertible in then vertically induced break. Since they spin so well, they cut gravity better because they cut the air better, so there's less friction yeah. on them. So they come in at a higher plane. So as a hitter, your brain is used to, that's fastball, it's going to come in at this angle. But with these guys, you have to retrain your brain going, it's not going to be here, it's going to be an inch higher. So that's why you see so many swings and misses with these types of fastballs. 
Yeah, that's 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 a great explanation. I mean, if if it's someone physics. like Eric and if someone like Eric and Danny are listening here, let me give you a simplistic version because I think that's too complicated <laughs> for them. Um, when Derek and I saw him at spring training, the best description is we saw him throwing against a screen from 30 feet, okay, warming up. And both of us sat there and said, oh, damn, I like that. I like that a lot. And then we saw him <laughs> go against the Royals. And I think that people, scouts were still talking about that performance. Guys were just swinging, you know, right underneath the ball, just like he said. And he was, and everyone knew what was coming. I mean, I think he threw one slider or a changeup. It was just pure heat. So that's the big thing with Iriarte going forward is he improved his command a lot this year from where he was in Lake Elsinore. And he thought he looked pretty good. He looked really good at Fort Wayne and San Antonio. They had a brief thing where they made him into a, a relief pitcher. Then he moved him back into the rotation. His slider is very good. His changeup is good. It's just a question of how consistent he can be. If it's me, I would keep him as a starter as long as I possibly can to make sure mm -hmm. if he's – because if he can start, if the, that slider and, you know, the changeup, I mean, that, that is a really high ceiling. I think he probably has the best fastball of all, any pitcher in, in the Padres system right now. I mean, it's really good. That's that's one that you can you can hear it cooking the air as it gets to home plate. Like it's it's what, it's a weapon. Well, yeah, his catcher Brandon Valenzuela said everything he throws is hard. He said his damn changeup is like ninety one, and that's like a, people are going that slow. And his slider when it's on is just impressive as anything too. So he's someone definitely to keep an eye on. Dylan Lesko. Dylan Lesko was a guy that was one of the easiest predictions to make when the Padres drafted in 2022. He got hurt. He slid down the draft. If he hadn't been hurt, he probably would have been a top three or top four pick. That's absolutely A.J. Preller's type of guy, ton of upside. He supposedly had Keith Lawson. He had one of the best change-ups of any high school pitcher he's seen, I think. He compared about one or two guys, and it is really a nasty change-up. Last year, he didn't start till June. He was coming back from Tommy John surgery. His velo came back, you know, and his command was just a little off, which is normal for people like that. The one thing that kind of surprised me is, and Kevin Cherry, and I saw him on his last start in Lake Elsinore, his curveball is every bit of we a weapon, too. That thing is an impressive thing. So, you know, if Lesko has a full off season to work, come back, I think he should start at Fort Wayne and he could be in San Antonio really quick i mean uh he's got three really solid pitches it's very good athlete you know he repeats his delivery he probably has a, as we talked about earlier in the show has a little bit higher ceiling than than robbie snelling but both both those guys if you're the padres and you see how much starting pitching costs you want to hang on to those guys are they untouchable which is a big question which Derek brings up no but you know you're gonna have it it have to be a hell of a trade for someone to, to get either of those guys included. How much work have you done on Drew Thorpe, the new guy in the system? Drew, well, Drew Thorpe, I haven't seen that much. I don't get up to see as many Somerset Patriot games where my wife won't let me after doing all this stuff. Uh, the interesting thing about Drew Thorpe was just how people looked at him. There were like three, yeah, Keith Law had a good one on him, you know, Saris and Eric Longenhagen. And they all had very, um, they also they had a plus changeup, but the part where they disagreed on was his fastball. Now, Law was saying it's about 90 and 93, and it's very straight. Sarah said, yeah, it's 90, 93, but it has a lot of movement. It has a lot of movement within the zone. It's not something to square up. And Eno went into, like only he does, all these different graphs and shapes and data, and he liked the fastball more because he said, you know, Velocity is big, but you know how much that thing moves within the zone is is huge too. So I guess what I'd like to see, he should start at San Antonio. The only thing I would caution people is if you're an A ball and you have a, a fastball that's in the low 90s and you can throw it out and you can throw it in and you got a really good changeup, you're going to be very successful. The mm -hmm. thing is, when you get to double A, you got to have you got to have a breaking pitch that can get those guys off of the fastball because most of them aren't going to swing at that changeup. And I'd like to see what the movement is. So he's, I thought was a, I thought that was a decent trade by the Padres that they sent over to, to the Yankees to get back what they did. And I think Thorpe is an interesting guy. 
And that could be a really loaded staff at the AA level. That could be something that, you know, could be pretty impressive. And by the end of the year, we could be talking about all the young pitching that the San Diego Padres have in the major leagues. And I'm going to give you a blast from the past because Mm. he is back. Luis Patino. I did like Luis. Yeah. (laughs) We all liked Luis Patino a lot. He was one of those centerpieces of the Blake Snow trade many moons ago. They just brought him back again because he got DFA'd by the White Sox. What has not worked for Luis Patino? Because his fastball is still in the mid 90s. We know he's got good stuff. I mean, that's never been in question. Is he just finding too much of the plate? Is it pitch sequencing? Is it a confidence thing? And can Ruben Niebla help fix this guy who's still, he's only 24 years old. He's basically prospect age right now. I think Ruben Niebla has become the Darren Balsley of, of the 21st century, just about. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think the guy who I think had the best, and he just went right off his numbers, was Jeff Sanders of the San Diego Union Tribune. He's more of a relief pitcher than he is a starter. He probably has trouble holding his velocity. He still has a very good fastball, as Derek said. He's got a good slider. He, I always kind of – I was never – he's a very strong guy. I mean, he's not – I think he's about six feet, 195. He's not, he's not a tall guy, but he's not a little man either. I just think he's more suited for the bullpen, and, you know, that can, that can help out. So I, I would expect to see him coming in there. For whatever reason, I didn't see enough of the Rays or or the White Sox games about why it didn't work out. I guess my assumption would be if he went into the data more, he'd probably have a tough, tougher time going the second time through the order. But, you know, he's a good pitcher, so a lot, lot to like. It was a good pickup by the Padres. We got about uh, 10, 15 minutes to okay. go, and I, I don't, I don't want to wait any longer and then run into uh... – run into the end of our time and then bring up Ethan Salas. So I figure yes. like, let's bring up Ethan Salas now, and then maybe we can get to some other entire names. podcast on Ethan Salas. We know the kid's going to be a hall of famer. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> when, when in 2024 is Ethan Salas coming up, John? I think, you know, I, the best question I got on that was on Twitter by uh, Jeff Dotseth. He asked me after about four games in Lake Elsinore, what his timetable was. And I said, well, right now, David J.R. and I are busy editing his Hall of Fame speech, and we're not sure if we're going with uh, Joe Mallon. So we need a little bit of time. You know, Ethan Salas, you know, we've talked about him before. I think Darnay and I pretty much did a whole podcast on him. Pretty he's, a, he's a great player. I, I had him as the number two guy, just being a junior in high school and playing full season professional ball is amazing. The only thing is I think I would pump the brakes a little bit is, you know, his first month, you know, he had a 311 on base. I think he hit about 191. The second month, he was tremendous. He was hit up to 361, you know, was player of the month, all those accolades, beautiful left-hand swing, even a better defensive player. And then the Padres kind of made a move, which I disagreed with. Instead of, I think, just letting him stay or finish in like Elsinore, you know, they promote him to Fort Wayne where I think he hit – um 200 i think in nine games and then san antonio before he went down i think with a a bit of a knee injury uh and he had about 191 it was just i I just think he's he's a really special talent and he just they should have pumped the brakes a little bit the padres now the counter argument what the padres would say is they wanted to get him up with the guys they think that are going to be part of their future especially the pitching staff they wanted to get him working with them. They believed he was mature enough and had the skill set that, you know, he could eventually overcome or make that jump on those difficulties. And, you know, maybe he can. But to me, I just don't see what the harm was keeping him in Lake Elsinore for the full year. And then we would have put him in Fort Wayne to start the year for at least a couple months and then have him go up. I just think it's easier when you have that progression because, put it this way, if if he's hitting – about 190 and it's june 1st you know both of you guys are going to go on tv and they kind of ask questions like, hey why was he promoted so quick what was the big rush why why did you promote a guy all the way to double a when he ate two of his three full months he was hitting under 200 and that's not going to be a question the Padres are going to like asking so i mean it and you go back to what we just said on jackson merrill when Merrill was struggling in Fort Wayne and being a month, there was never any thought that he needed to be sent back to Lake Elsinore. He's fine. Just leave him there. I think if he struggles a little bit in double A, I think that that is a legitimate question. Do you know the last teenager to start a major league baseball game behind the was plates? A, wasn't it Yvonne Rodriguez? 1991, Yvonne Rodriguez. Yeah. He, he turned out to be pretty good. He, yeah. He he, was, Ethan Salas has two years. 
Can will we see maybe not even this year? Will we see him by 2025 starting in the major leagues behind the plate as a 19 year old? I would say no, but then again, I've, I've it's kind of dipped into my credit card each time I've said AJ wouldn't do something. So, <laughs> you want to make a bet with Derek right now? Yeah, I'm sure Eric will sit there and throw that at me like that. And I mean, and the thing is, a guy his size usually doesn't eat before it goes on a little mini fast before we go out to eat, which is nice. So, he has a nice appetite to begin with. Yeah, and he brings along Danny, who can, despite being a guy of small in stature, can also eat pretty well. When, when do so, we get invited to lunch, John? When I, I want to, I want to, uh, Derek and I, we'll, we'll meet you at OG's or something. That'd be a good time. I'll, I'll definitely go to OG's with lunch for you guys anytime. I'm sure I'll make some stupid bet and shoot my mouth off. So it'll be a free meal or something like that. <laughs> Uh, so Salas, you, you would guess you, he starts in San Antonio and then, uh, I think, yeah, I think he does start in San Antonio. You know, look, he could come on really. I mean, he's got a beautiful swing, uh, the left-handed swing he has. It, I'm not saying it just cause he's a catcher. It does look like Joe Maurer, especially with a finish. He's already about six, two, his dad's six, four. He's probably going to grow some more, you know, on the podcast, my friend Donovan and Roy do, they had a really good interview with Robbie Snelling. And he talked about how much Salas grew uh, when Robbie first threw to him. He wasn't taking notes on all the hitters. You know, now Ethan prepares really well, and Robbie is working with him on that. And he was really proud about how much he progressed and called a game. You know, and some more, and like Elsner talked about, you know, just the jump from being 16 to being in professional baseball, you know, is incredible. I mean, I could not even imagine doing that, what he's doing when I was like a junior in high school let alone being good enough to do that. I mean, just the maturity he has is is, in, is a, incredibly impressive. So, yes, I do like Ethan Salas a lot, so you can address all your hate mail that I don't like Ethan Salas to Darnay. I mean, he, he will take that. Oh, and as a reminder, folks, that was Robbie Snelling who was doing those notes with him. Robbie Snelling himself is also a teenager. And 19, just yeah. to kind of dovetail on what you said, John, about how mature that kid is. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I believe you had a chance to talk to him, too. You've talked to him a few times, yeah. I think. Haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. You talked to Robbie Snelling and you're looking around going, yeah, he's, I have a teenager. There's no way. And these are even the same species, let alone that. I mean, yeah. yeah well, it reminds me of the guys like when I you know, go into like the Chargers locker room or something. You always find the guys who went to like Stanford or Northwestern. Like those, those are the, the really good young interviews just because they're mm -hmm. more put together. Robbie reminded me of a guy who went to and just had just graduated from an Ivy League school. He was just, yeah. he was just put together when you talk to him. Oh yeah. Just, I mean, just the maturity to sit there and make that decision. Like when he was a junior in high school, like, okay, I'm going to go to uh, baseball, even though most of my family is involved in football, football coaches, I need to redo my body. What's the best path for me to go. And yeah, I mean, he is both, both Robbie and uh, Jackson Merrill. When you are around those guys, you know, they're, they're big makeup guys. They're the type of guys AJ Preller is going to talk about. I mean, I know it's a bad cliche and I apologize, but they're, they're winners. I mean, they come across very much. If you watch a game with Merrill, he's always the first guy on the steps to congratulate a teammate. He realizes he's a top prospect. He always tells you, you should talk to this guy, interview him, make sure, you know, his family reads this. And David like to do that. It means really a very conscientious guy too. Both, both Ian Snelling come across like that. And as an SEC caliber outside linebacker, who's the first idiot to charge the mound on him? <laughs> I sure as hell wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to go well. Bring the bat no. with you if you try that with Robbie Snelling. I, I think I, you'd bring a couple guys with bats. I mean, at Robbie, I mean, and I think, I think what would be more, more upsetting would be if someone went after Robbie's catcher. Robbie would probably even be more upset about that. I mean. Oh, well, they'd have 60 feet of up. ramp to get on him. Yeah. I mean, he <laughs> then, you're, then, you're in, then you're getting, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Once Robbie gets to San Diego, I, I hopefully he'll get there. He'll pitch. I mean, he will be a big media favorite. Robbie's a very, very easy guy to talk to. Very intelligent. Can tell you exactly what he's doing, what he needs to work on. A, a true pleasure to interview. So I'm guessing your worst nightmare for Ethan Salas is he's a minor league invite to the big league camp. He impresses everybody. We see him in more minor league or see him more cactus league games, just like we did last year. And all of a sudden there's kind of those, those whispers. You would much rather him have an understated below the radar 
let him hang out in the smoker for a little bit long. He's got 14 hours to go. Let's not rush it at six hours type of spring yeah, training. Yeah, Eric, Eric tells me, look, here's his stats sitting against major league pitchers compared to minor league guys. He's going to start on the Padres. I say, you're an <laughs> idiot. I know this. I do this professionally. He'll say, how many times do we have to take your money, Conniff, before you finally shut up? And I'll say, not this time. And then I'll... You know, we'll be looking at about a three-figure bill at, at a local Chinese restaurant, which I think is the next place we're going to try. So, yeah, it would be something like that. Um, They're good guys. He, I tease them a lot. I really enjoy being around them. So it's it's even fun to lose bets to them. But go ahead. Uh, as we continue down the names, unless there's there's somebody top of mind for you, Derek, um, I can just keep plowing through my list. Um go for it. I don't know if we touched on Adam Mazur. I think his name might have come mm -hmm. up. I don't know how in-depth we got with him. No, I mean, Mazur's interesting guy because when I interviewed Mazur and I, I'd just seen him pitch, was I thought there's no way this guy throws in the mid-90s, which he did. He's about 6'2". He might be about he might be about 178 after three of those pork tenderloin sandwiches that I, I <laughs> sent uh, Darnay a picture of. Very intelligent guy, knows how to use his whole body. Uh, was at South Dakota State, then transferred to Iowa, was a Big Ten pitcher. I think Keith Law had a really good description, which is appro appropriate. Is he's got a good fastball that sits in about the mid 90s. He has a very, he's got a very good curve, slider, and change it. Probably a little bit more slider and change it right now. When all four of them are going, that's what makes him tough because the sum of the four makes him a little better than one individual pitch. But yeah, Mazur is someone to keep an eye on. That's why I think if the Padres are looking for an outfield fielder, a young, controllable guy, they possibly could trade one of the double-A pitchers. I don't think they would trade a Lesko, a Snelling, Iriarte, or Thorpe, but Mazur or Berger could be someone I could see them thinking about because they do need an outfielder. And as much as my my friend Derek here wants a Rosarena, I, I'm not sure the Padres are going to pay for that. So we'll see. I would like a Rosarena. He's going to do about seven million this year, and he got three years of arbitration. Yeah, but you know, you see those. I mean, the Padres right now remind me in college when we're looking at the couches and going underneath there to find spare dimes. I mean, <laughs> that's where they they are right now for a Taco Bell run. Yeah, I mean, that's what it reminds me of them. And the, the other guy out on my list was a guy who actually kind of, when I was watching a lot of those Elsinore games with um, with Lesko and Saul was playing, uh, Samuel Zavala. He Ooh. jumped. I mean, yes. that, the, the ball, again, not a very big guy. He had a couple of home runs that I don't think have landed yet. And he he really popped, for me at least, this year. Uh, where'd this kid come from and uh, what did, what is his timeline to really make an impact? Well, you, you were talking a little bit earlier about Castanon with the leg kick. So, I mean, I know if you were watching Zavala, that Zavala has a serious leg kick. And the Padres have yep. said that he can do that because his hands work so well. Mm -hmm. Zavala came in, he was about 10 pounds heavier than he was at Lake Elsinore. And he was there when he was 17. He was at Lake Elsinore this year when he was 18. Had a very good year. They put him in center. You know, he can do a little bit of everything. He can run. He's got some pop. He's a good athlete. He's from Venezuela. He's fluent in English. His fa he has a lot of family in Houston. He's a funny guy. I mean, really has a, a really good personality. Struggled a little bit, Fort Wayne. You know, he'll he'll come up there and he should do pretty. I think he'd do he pr pretty well. He's someone to watch. One thing with Ron Fort Wayne that's going to be a really fun outfield this year because you got Homer Bush Jr., who's probably one of the better athletes in the system. Incredible speed. And I know Derek's wife has more ties to Alabama. There's a guy that was a late round pick um, who had a good year, Tyler Robertson. He is about 6'4". I mean, he's like us. He's about 3% body fat at 210. <laughs> I mean, he can run. He And those three guys covering the outfield, it's just amazing to see. Robertson went to, I think it was Louisiana Lafayette. He's kind of a little bit more of a project, but man, and talk in terms of speed, power, athleticism, that's another sleeper. I, you know, I, I'm just going to be interested to watch him play this year, but all three of those guys can just really go get the ball. Uh, maybe we wrap up with a quick word on Dylan Head. Tommy was asking about him, what we should expect from him in the coming year. I haven't seen enough of Dylan Head, I mean, to really give a, a great analysis. And I'm always kind of, you know, I think on 
David and Kevin might do a little bit different when they do rankings and Ben and Mark is how much you're raking someone on kind of what they did as a prep. Dylan Head has tremendous speed. You know, he's going to play in center field. He'll be in Lake Elsinore this year. I expect him to run a lot more than he did this year. One thing that's kind of surprising about Dylan Head is he's got a really good idea of how to play play the game. You know, he has a really good eye at the plate. He understands what he's trying to do left-handed. Yeah, he should be a blast to watch. Another thing, too, real quick would be the Padres took a lot of tall, young pitchers. So you might want to, if you're really into it and you're a geek at this like we are, I mean, you might want to keep an eye on the Arizona Complex League. They're going to have a guy called uh, – the last guy, uh, they just got out of Texas, a big kid called Cannon Kemp, who's about 6'6 mm -hmm. and throws in the high 90s. He's someone that I remember I like quite a bit. Um, you know, there's I remember a guy when they drafted him. He's a ap aptly named Cannon. Yeah, huge. Yeah, huge guy. Should be kind of fun to watch. They got two late round picks, both about 6'4, six, 6'5. Six, They're young. So, you know, there could be some, some interesting guys down there to keep an eye on, too. And Carson Montgomery is a guy they got out of Florida State, who's one of the highest ranked guys in upon the college campus. He struggled at Florida State for whatever reason. Padres took him in 11th round, 200,000. The thing with him is he throws in the mid 90s, but he has a real straight fastball. He's got a good slider and good changeup. And so, you know, if you're one of those pitching development coaches, and, you know, as much as I like Jackson Wolf, who was the guy who was uh, traded, you know, to, to Pittsburgh, you know, he was six, seven, and he could kind of touch 90 occasionally, you know, and he really worked with him to get there. But you tell a pitching coach, you know, if you guys were that, like, hey, here you go. This guy throws in the mid 90s. He needs a little bit more deception, kind of mix around where a slider and changeup goes. The guy goes, let's go. I mean, right now, because you have the talent and you can work with him. So that, that would be a good guy to, I think, to keep an eye on as well. Hey, he went to Florida State, man. If he doesn't make the major leagues, he'll just sue, saying that he should be there. <laughs> John, you're the best. We appreciate you. Appreciate all that you guys do. Obviously, if if you don't know of Mad Friars, you, you should. If you're a Padres fan, check them out. Uh, support them and all that they do. Uh, we appreciate it. Be on the lookout for the upcoming rankings. And let's get lunch sometime when you're in San Diego. Let's make it happen. Definitely. And thank you guys for always having me on. It's always a blast. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you guys at spring training. Absolutely. And we'll, I'll tell you what, the spring training, we will actually try to find a place in Peoria. It will be difficult, but we, we got a couple of options. So uh, we'll definitely do lunch or something like that if you guys are out there. I'm in. No, the Let's hard part is finding a non chain in Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not eating at Olive Garden. I'm half Italian. That's just not going to happen. So uh, my apologies to Marty Caswell, who's a friend of mine. I'll say this when she's not listening because I'm afraid of Marty. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Salt your water. It's not that difficult. <laughs> Oh, exactly. exactly. You're the best. Thank you, John. Thanks, guys.